this is Sam Gerrans from samgerrans.com. Today is Friday, March 3rd, 2023, and the topic today is propaganda as a part of technique. Now, technique, what's technique? Well, I was talking about technique in the last uh, program from yesterday. Technique is a concept which was made popular by Jacques Silul, and this book here is The Technological Society. Uh, if you want to know what I'm talking about in some of, of what I'm doing now, then read this, buy it and read it. Uh, I'm not affiliated with it. It's dead anyway. <laughs> but I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't know, weaponizing it or financing it or whatever you call it, monetizing it. That's the word I'm looking for. No, just go and find a copy of it and buy it. Probably better to get a secondhand one. And this is the other book that I'm referencing as well, which is Propaganda, The Formation of Men's Minds. And this book, which I'll be looking at a very small part of today, was written in, I believe, 1965. 1965. And you will find that the kind of the sweet spot for for books worth reading in, in this sort of political scientific uh, subject range is anything up to about 1980. After 1980, when the universities, in fact, even earlier than that, the universities in the west coast of America and then moving across America and being rolled out across Europe and everywhere else uh, became useless. They are useless now. I really, only fools go there <laughs> or teach there. Um, there's no reason to go to university. I'm sure the, you know, there may be one or two departments left, but actually they're just indoctrination centres and um, uh, full of midwits. So the really bright people don't go anymore. Anyway, uh, but going back to to this time when Ilul was writing, uh, there was it was still possible to have a brain and teach in the university and not have to um, comport with the politically correct nonsense that goes on today. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to read uh, a, just a quote from his preface. It's very short. It's just a couple of snippets. And then I'm going to kind of riff on that subject. So he says on page 10, Propaganda is made, first of all, because of a will to action for the purpose of effectively arming public policy. For the purpose of effectively arming public policy and giving irresistible power to its decisions. Now, what he's saying is, is that propaganda is a part of government. And when he's talking about government, he's still talking about something which perhaps made sense in the 1960s, but which is completely nonsensical today in terms of government. Uh, the, the people that you vote for, the, the sort of um, the show business for ugly people. Obviously, this is uh, just one aspect of power today. But much more power is wielded today by corporations and by NGOs and by individual very, very wealthy men, uh, particular racial and uh, other kind of agglomerations of interests uh, which uh, work to their own agendas. Um, foundations, so-called, um, what are they called, those people who... Uh, uh, give money supposedly give money away i'm blanking on the word at the moment um that's a bill gates is supposed to be philanthropist that's it these are huge money uh, power bases and whoever controls the spigots to that um, power base is able to affect change um George Soros is a good example, but not only you have things like the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, all of these foundations, and these foundations, they're they're um, then they're entities that have their own life. So, as uh, the late and very great uh, Alan Watt used to say, that's Alan Watt without an S. Um, you know these these organisations, they hire, they have an agenda, they have a a plan which goes on, which runs for tens. Of, tens, fifties, hundreds of years, whatever it is. And they hire and retire CEOs who just spend their whole lives pushing this same agenda. Anyway, this is what power is. But so what my point is, is that governments in the sense that we're trained to think of them have, they do have some power, they do have some power, but it's not very, it's not a huge amount. It's not as much as you think it would, it might be. And more particularly, that's the case in the West. So they're sort of one part of it. Anyway, Propaganda is made, first of all, because of a will to action. 
What well, is a will to action? Well, it, it means you've got a plan. It means you want to do something. So let's say, you know, you want your child to make make a bed and clear up a room. That's a will to action. We want this to happen. So for the purpose of effectively arming policy, well, that's my policy. I wish my, uh, my child to clear up her room. So that's my policy. How do I make that happen? And giving irresistible power to its decisions. How do I make it uh, irresistibly something which is going to happen? This is how the world managers think about you lot, right? They know you're dumb. Uh, they made you dumb, so they're very sure about that. They know that they've been working through a, a process of, of uh, denuding the education system of any possible chance of giving you any tools to be able to fight them. Why wouldn't you? I mean, if you were in their position, you, you know, for them this is quite an obvious thing to do. And, and you know, you have to, you know, we're not all like this, but, but seeing as this is their worldview, they'd be very stupid to do anything else. So that's what they do. They make you stupid. They know how bright you are because they can measure it all in real time now. And um, so they know what you're doing with your time and that mainly you're wasting it. So they know that you're getting stupider and so they can make propaganda to, to suit the reality of a, an increasingly stupid society, which is why, if you're not stupid, uh, and you look at the propaganda of today, it seems so asinine, but they, they, they're correct. They know that if they were to make it any cleverer, any, any you know, the qu higher quality, um, it would just fly over everybody's, over everybody's heads. So you get people like Bell True, who's somebody I have a bit of a, um, a bit of a be in my bonnet about, who's a propagandist for The Guardian. Um, it's, I mean, it's shameless war propaganda. But but if it were anything else, it wouldn't work. And it's 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 actually, to be fair to her, it's it's the correct kind of propaganda for the sort of people who read the Guardian. Anyway, just to continue, this I'm skipping a bit. This is page ten. If I didn't mention that before, of this uh, of this preface, quote: Not only is propaganda itself a technique. Now I'm going to come back to this because technique. This book, the second book, I hope you can see this. I'm going to put it where I hope it's um, going to be visible. It's called The Technological Society by the same author. And it was written in 1964. Actually, I think these days, no, 1954. The French edition was in 1954. 1954. These things, things were known and talked about openly by intelligent men. 1954. Couldn't have this conversation today. Um. And, it, you know, the fact that I'm synthesizing these ideas and making them you know, available you know, available and accessible kind of makes me look, you know, perhaps more intelligent than I am. It, it, it's, it's, see how we're degrading. I mean, you look around at the uni university professors today and, and, and certain, I'm not going to name people, but very, very high profile, supposedly highly intelligent men. Mm, I don't know, perhaps not so much when you read, <laughs> read somebody like this. Uh, we're all degrading. Let's move the table a bit. And uh, anyway, the point I want to make is this. He, he says in this other book, if you, if you just read two books in the next year, read these two books. Read them slowly because every word ma means something in these books. Not only is propaganda itself a technique, it is also an indispensable condition for the development of technical progress. Progress is a loaded word. We'll get into that another time. And the establishment of a technological civilization. It's indispensable. But the first point he makes is that it is a technique. A technique. And this, when he's talking about the technological society, I think in, in the French it's not called that. Um, it's just called technique. Um He's not talking about a technical society necessarily. He's not talking about computers and so on primarily. Well, he's talking about something else. He's talking about technique. Now, what technique means is essentially, as I said yesterday, it's, it's um, leaving aside any other consideration except for a rational, pragmatic approach to things. So, going back to my notes say in here somewhere else um yes technique is about efficiency pragmatism with no regard for history tradition religion god faith any non-material or non-temporal concern the concerns that were primary 
for most of human history are now thrown out, thrown on the dumpster. Okay, that's technique. That's why the world is now insane. It's technique. Technique requires it over and above governments and particular cliques and cabals and you know racial interests, whether it's the Chinese or whoever it is. It's far above all of that. Okay. And what he's saying here is that propaganda itself is a technique. It is a requisite technique. It is part and parcel of the technological society, i.e. the society which is predicated not upon you know, the uh, respect for your ancestors or anticipation of the Day of Judgment or any kind of moral consideration whatsoever. I mean, they do have morals, uh, but those morals are subservient to, to technique in, in all cases. Hence, homosexualization. Hence, the paedophilia agenda. Because once you unhinge from scripture, from tradition, from objective, accepted norms, you're just thrown upon the raging seas. Now it's just you screaming, who, I'm not, and me screaming, so who can shout loudest? Well, whoever controls technique, you see? So it's not just about you know conspiracies and you know, we hate the purple people or the green people or whatever it is. There are, the whole thing is, is subordinate to technique. And as I'm going to get into in, in future talks, the whole East-West dichotomy, this idea that the Russia, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but seeing as it's going to be part of my broader presentation, that, for example, the, the fair world order that's emerging as it's, as it's, as it's held to be, with Russia and China at its core, and say Brazil and um, South Africa, uh, India, who are throwing off the shackles of this unipolar American, you know, Pax Americana, where basically they have the rules-based order, which is you do what America says or we come and bomb you. This is seen as some sort of polarity, some sort of dichotomy. It's like a, like, uh, like a these are good and these are bad, or relatively speaking, these are good and relatively speaking, these are bad. But it's a false choice. And the reason that it's a false choice is because the countries of the so-called fair world order hold to absolutely every single thing that technique requires, as does the West. And if, if those countries did not, they would be destroyed. Now, whilst they have some residual residual, and this is residual, vestigial um, attachment to tradition in the case of, let's say, Russian Orthodox Church. It is vestigial, it is residual, it's, it's nominal. And if it were to be any more than that, it would impede upon technique and make Russia inefficient and make it, therefore, vulnerable to the attacks of the superior technique practiced upon it by the countries of the so-called West. This is what I'm trying to get to. This is a false choice that we're being presented with. Is it a matter of, you know, is Putin in, you know, the secret club and he's really doing this and doing that? I don't think so, but I don't know. But I don't. I actually don't think so. I, I have reasons for that. However, I don't think it matters because of what technique is. So if you want to see through some of this, th these aren't my ideas. Oh, well, I, I'm, you know, I, I've done some reflection on it. But the original thinking here was done by others. And you can read their works. They're still accessible. I would I advise you to hurry up and buy them while while stocks last. OK, so technique is about efficiency, pragmatism, with no regard, again, for history, tradition, religion, God faith or any non-material or non-temporal concern the concerns which were primary they were principal they were, they were the they were the foundation blocks of ancient greece or wherever ancient rome the medieval ages and as we entered mid so-called modernity all of those were thrown on the trash heap to use the american term and um this is what people actually miss because technique doesn't require community. 
It doesn't require, in fact, in fact, communities is, 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 is an intrusion upon technique. So technique makes you atomized. Technique makes you lonely. Why? Because it's more efficient. You're easier to manage. And this is how it works. And what I'm saying is technique has has a life and a set of requirements all of its own. It's not only that there are cabals and, you know, secret handshakes and all the rest of it. I'm sure those things exist. They do. I'm not denying them. But I am saying that there are the, 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 the train itself. It's got its own momentum. And those who understand real politic work with that. They don't try to stop. They don't throw themselves across the tracks of the oncoming train. No, they're not idiots. They just move the tracks, you know, one degree to the you know, east or the west and 200 miles down the road, you're, you know, in a completely different country. So that that's how it really works. Um. So now I want to get back into the, the question of, of propaganda. Now for Jacques Delal, propaganda is an intr intrinsic, it's an int integral part of technique. The two go together. A bit like, you know, um, I don't know, cream and cream and milk. It's the, the, they, they, they are, the cream is a function of the milk, just so propaganda is a function of a requisite result of what technique is and what it requires. I'm not here inveighing against technique. I'm not here saying, all oh, these evil people, oh, they should stop doing this. Because this is what you get to too. You get a lot of people, what they what they want to do is, like women, okay, that I was talking about last time, they want to cherry pick. What they want is a, a technological society where they still have iPhones and you know iPads and uh, electronic trains, communication systems, um, you know, Gmail, Bluetooth, and all the rest of it. But they don't want all this other stuff that they don't like. Well, what you're asking for is for there to be cream with no milk. Okay? That's what you're doing. And it doesn't work that way. You can't cherry pick in this way. It, it, is, as, it is as idiotic as... Uh, you know, the, the, the things I was saying about certain female mentalities, where they just want to cherry pick the, the, the wonderful things that men have, not realizing that actually very few men have those things, and and they don't want any of the other stuff. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Technique doesn't allow it to, because your little opinion doesn't matter within technique. You're just you're not within technique. You're not a uh, created in in the image of God, and are fated to live forever in, whether in heaven or in hell no you're an atom a meaningless blip on a hard drive and that hard drive is going to be you know it's going to be wiped and you know reformatted and that's the end of you under technique and so that's how it is and you can't have both and i'm not here to fight against technique which is what kaczynski um advocated i'm going to get into some kasinski later because he's very interesting now um, i think it's uh, not possible i think we technique has us cornered we've painted ourselves into a corner and the only way uh, the only way out of it is in my opinion is through uh apocalypse now it's not going to be uh, a, a popular cell i understand that people you know they 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 they, they want they, they want more of everything and they're afraid to die and i understand that um but that's my analysis and if it weren't i would just say say so but it is okay i'm going to read this this bit again then we'll get into the main part of what i want to say so not only is propaganda itself a technique it is also an indispensable condition for the development of technical progress and the establishment of a technological civilization it is an indispensable condition this isn't an add-on. This isn't a bolt-on. This isn't a you know a nice to have. This is an indispensable condition. It is uh, a priori. It is it is a, a requirement, a foundation upon, or an intrinsic part of this thing. So, if you like all of the efficiencies of scale, which the logistics chains bring you, if you like Amazon and you like iPhones and you like being able to dial out for a pizza and you like all of this other stuff then you have to accept, you have to accept propaganda because it's propaganda which allows this to happen. Okay? Now I'm going to skip down to one of the footnotes again on page 10. He 
He says, Harold D. Laswell's definition of the goal of propaganda is accurate. Quote, to maximize the power at home by subordinating groups and individuals while reducing the material costs of power, end quote. It's an efficiency program. If you've studied how, you know, um, scale works in business, economies of scale, propaganda fits into that. Now, you might call it marketing, but it's propaganda. And we'll get into what it is. Uh, continue To continue, similarly, in war, propaganda is an attempt to win victory with a minimum of physical expense. Before the war, propaganda is a substitute for physical violence. During the war, it is a supplement to it. Okay. This is how it works. This is reality, according to Jacques Silul, who I rate very highly. I don't agree with all of his work. You know, he, he's got other books that I've looked at and read. and not, But these two... Propaganda, the formation of men's attitudes and the technological society should be required reading. Required. Anyway, I'm going to get into a few points and then wrap this up. So we are propagandized because it is more efficient than the alternatives. And what are the alternatives? The alternatives is poking, you know, it's in the back with a gun, making us, to, making us do things. It's far more efficient to get the slaves to think that they're free and to get them, you know, willingly and happily um working on the plantation singing you know you know uh, uh, swing low sweet uh, what is it three chariots coming for to carry me home you know you want a happy slave on the plantation this is this is what propaganda does this is what it's for so the most efficient propaganda uh, the propagandist understands is that which can uh, convinces you that you are a free so it has to convince you that you're free, that for it to work. B, that you have a choice, which is, you know, which is connected with being free, that you actually have a choice. And C, that you are a willing participant in and, and an effective participant in the process of decision making. And this is really what democracy is there for. That's what democracy is. If you try to nail down what democracy really is, it's a moving target is very difficult. But Whatever the the source it's being kind of is being served up under, it has these things. You you kind of have to believe that you're free, and that you have a choice, and that you're a willing participant, and and that your 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 voice matters. Now, with the uh, with the rollout of the pandemic a couple of years ago, it was very interesting to see these poor poor fools eventually realizing, huh? you mean we're not free? No, of course not, you poor. Poor fool, you never were. Now at last, they kind of come up against uh, who was it? Frank Zappa. I don't like his music or anything, but he was a, he was a bright man, and you know, he said that the the time's coming when they're going to just you know they're going to pull down the backdrop and all the scenery, and you're going to come up and see that there's just a there's a concrete wall at the, at the end of the stage that that was always there. Well, this is it. This this was always there, and I've always felt this. I've always known it. Um, I I don't put this down to any you know superior intelligence on my part. I don't know. I just some people are good at some people have got a musical ear. Well, I I have an ear for this, and I just always have. But uh, growing up in the nineteen seventies, as I as I, it's become a bit of a set phrase with me now. Um, it was almost impossible to find anybody because I was born awake. You know, this this awake thing, I was actually born in and it was extremely painful to be around people who were so conditioned. Uh, my family and, you know, everyone, it was it was it was it was actually painful. It's you know, that thing where people take a knife and drag it down a plate or chalk on, on, on a blackboard. I, I spent my whole life feeling like this. Um, uh, a, a kind of un an unwanted sensitivity to it all. Um, again, going back to Alan Watt, Watt without an S. Um, he said, I remember him saying that as things go forward, it's actually going to become easier for people who can see. 
and it's going to become more and more difficult for those who who can't or have only latterly woken up or still think that they can get back to something that it was before or think they, they have a choice. They're holding on to these three things. They think they're free, they think they have a choice, and they think they are a participant in what's going on. And until you disabuse yourself of those three illusions, you know, you're still just treading excuse, you're still just treading water it's ridiculous but he said on he said for them it's going to get more and more difficult and they're going to become more and more frustrated as they try to hold on to all the things that they were promised uh, you know the trinkets and the, the this and the that but for those of us you know these poor people who were almost like the, the the intellectual lepers of western society um in some ways it's going to become easier for us at, because we already knew it it's almost it's not exactly a relief but you can see yes I was right. I can. I, I'm, you're not surprised by anything. It's just you can see that, that that's what you're living through. I, I don't know how much of a um, how much of a comfort that is. So to go back to these three pillars of belief uh, that you're free, that you have a choice, and that you're a willing and active participant, effective participant in the process of decision, are those things true? Well, no, of course they're not complete nonsense why didn't you know that so the legend of democracy is most useful in this regard and it requires one to believe that uh, that yeah it requires someone to believe four things the first is because actually you know democracy is, is a is, you question it people are aghast that you wouldn't you're, you're not you haven't th thrown yourself prostrate before the the altar of democracy, which is really a kind of a form of, of of humanism, and if you question it, which which I have done for years, people they look at you, they look at you as, as if you just invented cold fusion or something, except not in a good sense. They, 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 it would never have occurred to them in a million years. So, but democracy requires you to believe several things. First is that all adults are of equal decision making capability. Why would you think that? B, that all adults have a mind worth consulting. And by adult, I mean anybody over the age of majority, which is now whatever it is, 18. C, that all adults are not hopeless victims stroke targets of propaganda designed by others. And D, that the mathematical process by which the results are arrived at uh, uh, is in some way holy. You have to believe those four things. And people do, but they don't question. They don't even really ask the question, but that's what they believe. You have to believe it. Otherwise, democracy suddenly you know, just is a chimera. It's nothing. But none of these things is true. Let's just go through them again. All adults are of equal decision-making capability. I mean, is that true? Of course not. How many, how many really, really intelligent people have you met in your life? I mean, you know, highly intelligent people have you met in your life? Now, hold that number and then just think, well, how many total morons have I met in my life? And then compare them. I'm think you're thinking you're going to be on like a you know a, a twenty to one ratio, with you know the morons being in the twenty. Democracy, how it's idiotic. So the next one is um, that all adults have a mind worth consulting. <sighs> next one, that all adults or all people over the age of eighteen, because they're hardly adults. I mean. Most people are dying now, 65, 70, 75. They're not. They're, it's just children, just old age children. That all adults or all people of the age of 18 are not hopeless victims stroke targets of propaganda designed by others. But we know that they are. They are because of what technique is. They have to be. Otherwise, otherwise we wouldn't have a modern civilization. It only works because, tech, because they are you know, hopelessly propagandized if they were anything else you wouldn't have your iphones and you wouldn't have the bluetooth and the, you know the the, the cappuccino and, the, the, and all of that you wouldn't have it it wouldn't work it would not work it has to have have to be able to propagandize the majority of people for it to work by definition and that the mathematical process by which the results you know, the elections as they call them are arrived at is somehow holy why would you think that? It's it's it is a ludicrous concept. Well, people say, well, ancient Greece, you know, the Greeks were clever and they had democracy. Yeah, but what did they think about democracy? If you, they knew that it was one step away from tyranny. That's how they described it. Firstly, secondly, uh, it, it was n nothing like what you think of being democracy. It was uh, it was a meeting of men, white men, white 
usually slave owning men in a forum debating a question where they they knew each other personally where they could see each other face to face that's what they had and made a, 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 in a city state they weren't asking and they weren't allowing people who had no um place in that society who were not uh, citizens for the, uh, male citizens for the, for their for their opinion and um anyway it all collapsed but somehow you know with the the renaissance everybody got very passionate about what they th imagined greece to have been although their imaginations if you read people like spengler he'll tell you that was complete nonsense it was it's like it's a bit like brand islam what i call brand islam they have an imagination of what things were like 1400 years ago and that's become what they call islam and now they want to push that but actually it probably wasn't very much like that or oh, it's a, a very eclectic selection of of uh, of narrative snippets all kind of weave woven together into into a narrative that now we're going to believe uh, lies agreed upon as napoleon would have said so anyway to carry on so none of these things are true democracy in inverted commas or not in inverted commas is a religion pushed upon the masses by a ruling elite which constitutes 0.001 percent of the population is it not hilarious that naught point naught naught one percent have convinced 99.999% that the majority view is the one that matters. And every, I, I'm really kind of, kind of addressing my comments and my presentation here to the people who are so gung-ho uh, about what they see as the fair world order and all the rest of it. And they think that they're going to achieve some sort of democracy and that democracy is inherently a wonderful thing. And unless you understand technique and propaganda, it, it seems to me that they're really just um, rolling out. They're, they're really, I don't want to be rude, but in some ways they're playing the role of the unthinking foot soldiers for the New World Order, to, you know, just to say what I actually think, okay? naive at least it's been astounding to me over the years because i've been you know what you might call you know on, on the fringes of intellectual thought for m actually all of my life and over much of it certainly the internet years i've seen people talking about getting very hot under the collar about the, the rollout of the new world order and all of this and i agree i i agree i mean i th i would see it as being a a, 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 a sort of condition of involution which is unavoidable as a society as a civilization collapses it destroys itself but you know they they see it all as evil and, and a tyranny and i agree it is evil and it is a tyranny but those same people many of them have now in in the last since 24th of february of last year have turned into um the the hurrah club for the fair for the fair world order not understanding that this is a a false choice in my view and it's nothing to do with whether this politician or that politician is on this or that side it's because the actual the chemistry of the of of the uh society of this world society it's a world society it doesn't matter which country so-called is in the is in the ascendancy they're all using technique they're all using propaganda because they have to because if they don't they're going to be destroyed anyway when we talk of propaganda we tend to think of george orwell but actual propaganda well not actual propaganda it is partly george orwell but 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 it, if you read and you must read propaganda the formation of men's attitudes this book i've mentioned a few times you'll find that he talks about um what he calls agitprop which is what you've got now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the war in ukraine with somebody like Belle True from The Guardian. She's an agit propagandist. She's, an, you know, she's chosen her life. She's going to have to deal with the consequences of that. But, you know, objectively, she's a, she's a propagandist. She's a war propagandist. And that's all she is. You know, she, she's not, she isn't interested in truth in any sense. She's there to, you know, manipulate, you know, 
the, the type of people who read The Guardian, which I'd say is probably very easy um, by virtue of the fact is that they are the type of people who read The Guardian. But anyway, but the more effective, so that's agitprop, but there's there's the kind of the integral, integrated propaganda, which is what is which is Pop-Tarts, it's Nirvana, it's fixed rate mortgages and lipstick. That's what the real propaganda is. This is the background propaganda. This is what you grow up with. And the way these things are packaged and presented assume a world view which is never questioned. Now, going back to Goebbels, who was in, influenced by Bernays. The way that the propaganda of the Third Reich films, and so on, I've mentioned this before, but the way that films worked, it wasn't that, you know, um, Hans and Ursula uh, discovered the joys of the Third Reich and uh, ran off and joined the SS together and had lots of little Nazi babies and lived happily ever after. That wasn't the storyline. Uh, having read, you know, various, uh, you know, <laughs> various books. No, it was that Hans and Ursula met and fell in love and went, you know, walking in the Alps together or whatever it was on a backdrop of a Third Reich which was righteous and good and fair in all things and worth fighting and dying for. That's how it works. But that's how it all works. That's how Hollywood works. That's how it works when they're pushing the homosexual agenda down your throat or softening you up for paedophilia. That's how it works. That's how propaganda works, okay? So the way these things are packaged and presented assume a worldview which is never questioned. Now, I've got a few comments I want to make about the Soviet Union. People think, ah, oh, the Soviet Union, it was all terrible and awful. Well, it was, some of it was, some of it wasn't. Now, in the Soviet Union, you were allowed, people don't know this, they tend to think you were just all locked down, but that's not true. You were allowed to criticise things publicly in newspapers. You know, people, a Soviet citizen was, was always writing letters to the newspaper. And you could denounce the local authorities you, uh, for failing to paint, the, you know, the particular park benches in, in your courtyard and, you know, write a heavily worded, you know, a strongly worded letter to the, you know, to Izvestia or whatever it was. Komsomolska uh, Pravda. You could criticise the nurseries for providing poor lunches or whatever. But what you could not do was criticise the system and the assumptions upon which that system was based as the cause of the problem. That's what you can't do. Now, um, how many of those who genuinely think they are free under what I rather mockingly think of uh, when people talk about democracy are free and empowered actively to choose what has happened to them? Actually, none. <laughs> because... None of them were consulted, not one that I know of. So the core events over the last hundred years, let's say, excuse me a second, which include, but are not limited to, feminism, the destruction of the family, uh, pillaring and usurping fathers, the persecution of boys, destruction of uh, male um, provenance. There's nowhere men can go now where women are not insinuating themselves into every single place. Snooker halls and pubs and gentlemen's clubs. There's nothing. Women are everywhere. Golf clubs. They're just everywhere. Who chose that? Um, the women themselves would not normally have chosen that. They've just been highly, highly um, propagandized. And women are easier to propagandize, and there the are reasons for that. Uh, you know, you hate me down below if you wish, but but it's true. Um, because women are collectivistic, and women, uh, they, they, uh, they're basically reading other women to see what is acceptable, and they'll go along with that. Whereas men are far more conservative. Just by nature, we have to be because we've got to protect the family. Whereas women are superb at collecting information and sort of, and sort of taking it home and passing it on to the husband. And the husband doesn't really listen, probably if he's a happy husband, not very much anyway. But he is listening out for key words. 
And so this this is what really is going on. So the woman is collecting information, and then the man is not really listening. But you know, if 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 the word like you know, no 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 you know, going to jump into action. It, it, we're made this way. This isn't a criticism. It's just an observation. Um, so women are the shock troops. Uh, they've been weaponized in the same way as, you know, the working classes were weaponized under com, um, Marxism 1.0. Women and many other groups, all, all kinds of other groups, have been weaponized. They've been weaponized to destroy the standing order, being promised that it's that which is oppressing them and that when this is all been overthrown they're going to be free but they're too dumb to understand that <laughs> it's the only thing that's protecting them against the tsunami of tyranny that's actually coming so there's that uh, the rise of anti-white racism a mass immigration the dumbing down of schools the homosexualization and now pedophilization if that's a word of society i'm not saying I, n no one was questioned about any of this n no one no one in the west said yeah that's what we want now if we had a democracy if you think that's a good idea, we would have discussed this and said, should we do this? And let's say, if you, if, if you, if you believe in a democracy and that 51% of the vote is, is holy and that you have no responsibility to your fathers, your forefathers, your religion, your country, your culture, any of those things, and everybody voted for these things, that would be a different matter. But that conversation never, ever happened. What happened was these things were driven through in a by an agenda and then anyone who had any questions about this is now a bigot. And this is actually, you know, straight, well, the, the feminization and destruction of the family, I suppose, really started after the First World War, after tens of millions of European men were gunned down in their, you know, in the bled to death in the trenches. And then uh, the rest of the agenda kicked in after World War II, after they'd just done the same all over again. And so it rather sticks in the craw when you're, you know, for myself, my f grandfather's line, the, the admirals, all admirals, gave their life for their country over, 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 over centuries. And, you know, you can understand why people don't like it. But my point isn't this. I would say that this is what's happening is actually, again, an effect of technique. And it's more efficient to have people fighting amongst themselves. It's more efficient to have people who... Um, live in a country but actually have got nothing much in common with, with anybody else, nothing to bind them together except except participation in the, the lies of the propaganda of technique. And that's why they destroyed the Islamic countries. You can't have people who believe in God or living in one country agreeing to a particular worldview. No. What they need is Coca-Cola and lipstick. And yet those countries themselves now, they think that they can hold on to their traditions Whilst also keeping the mobile telephones and the, you know and you know the pop tarts and all the rest of it, they don't understand that these are mutually exclusive. Just uh, uh, by the by, I was recently in Chechnya, which I really like Chechnya. I mean, it's a bit kind of uh, throat cutty, <laughs> a little bit, but the bits which are good um, are excellent, and I got a lot of respect for the Chechen people. And being in Grozny, which is the capital of Chechnya. You can see that they're, 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 they've still got something which is great. They've still got some residual, vestigial um, culture and traditions and ways of doing things and families looking out for each other's children and all of this stuff, which was fantastic. Georgia was a bit like that as well. But you can see that it's on the decline. And it's on the decline because of technique. You can see the young women now walking up and down. They've got the main street in Grozny is called Prospekt VV Putina. VV Putina. <laughs> Not just Prospekt Putina, but Prospekt VV Putina. Uh, which uh, kind of says a lot, really, about, about uh, the relationship. And these young women, uh, a lot of them, I, I couldn't put a number on it, but they, they've got this duck face thing, these duck lips where everyone looks I, I don't know I think it's really really horrible clearly they don't but again they're easy to prop to propagandize because they're looking to each other for um, you know for their orientations all that to say is you can see that Chechnya is dying culturally even though they're very strong and they are very it's a very manly culture it's a male dominated culture and all of that 
and in that sense it's fantastic but they're not going to be able to survive technique because the in order to survive they're going to have to adopt technique technique is mobile telephones it's you know it's women comparing themselves not with women in the village or even in the town but these women all over the world becoming indoctrinated poisoning the children it's 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 like mustard gas and there's nothing you can do there's nothing you can do it's really really sad it's really sad so to continue about choice and the complete absence of it you know how many people in Chechnya chose that now on the one hand they like they like the the mobile phones and uh you know the black cars with the the red is it called caliper brakes i don't know um and all of that but they don't like this other stuff but you can't pick and choose with it the the arab countries are attempting to do it failing miserably in my in my view so which of the wars do we choose in the west who do you know who who said yeah let's let's go and bomb iraq that let's we those libyans let's go and kill all of them serbians afghanistan no no nobody chose any of this all of these are plans all of them are plans which suit the elites and your mind is shaped to suit and if you don't like it they've got some names to call you and these these are not just i'm not just conveying here from the point of view of a European, these are wars against everybody. They're wars against the, the, the people who come and live in Europe. You know, their culture has been destroyed just the same. I, I, I personally am in favour of actual diversity. Uh, it's a, a bit of a trigger word now. But um, it's very, very difficult to maintain any kind of cultural heritage when you're all mixed together in a paste. It doesn't work that way. That's why I was very interested in the Hasidic Jews when I was in New York. Because somehow or another, they managed to maintain some kind of wall. They managed to live in New York and yet preserve their, I mean, whether you like it, you don't like it, whether you think it's good or bad, that's not what I'm discussing here. But they managed, they managed to preserve it. And um, it's, it's an incredible achievement when you consider what they're living in. So, um, so while some people can see that... Um, Let's take an extreme example of Belle True, who I've mentioned before, at The Guardian, uh, who they can see that she's an unconscionable war propagandist, which, which she is, and nothing more. They cannot see the true and more insidious propaganda is that which makes up what they think of as their culture. So it's what I'm trying to say is that it's it's easier to see that what you've got, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, you understand that this is a, you know, this is agit prop. And, uh, you know, what they, they say about Russia, they did this and this this terrible crime and this terrible crime and this terrible crime. Probably they didn't. Or, you know, it, it certainly wasn't a matter of policy. Um, and you know, normally, this is just ridiculous. I mean, I'll just give you an example. They actually want you to believe that Russia bombed its own pipeline. In Nord, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. If, you know, they think you're so retarded that you'll believe it or that you'll just forget about it. And if you live in Germany, uh, it's really hard to forget about things if you're freezing cold and you've got no industry left. Because the only reason you had, the only reason that Germany was, you know, the sort of economic engine of Europe was because it was uh, getting very, very cheap gas from Russia. That's it. That's the reason. Anyway. So... The more important thing, in in conclusion, is this intrinsic propaganda. Um, it's what you get. It's what you get in all the advertising. It's what you get, and and people become repeaters. They just repeat this thing. It's um, it's what you get in education. It's it's your world view. It's why you believe that you probably that you you developed from a fish. That, grew out of the sea for no reason whatsoever this is the real propaganda this is what shapes your worldview shapes your story and in the traditional society we all had other other stories we had the vedas or we had you know we had the hebrew scriptures or we had the quran or we had you know whatever it was we had you know, the, the nordic tales the celtic tales you know we had these things this was the story we had um the odyssey and the iliad this was the story that informed our collective mind that's those have all been rejected pushed away thrown on the on, on on the dumpster 
and a new story has been created. And this new story is one about um, a meaningless life in which progress is implicit and enjoyment of the now is the only true value. It's kind of it. And that's attached in some way to an in in GDP. <laughs> it's sort of it. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but, but, but people accept it. If that's why they're basically nihilists. That's why they get depressed. And so this intrinsic propaganda is far more important to the business of producing and managing a docile, obedient and predictable herd. There you are. That's really what I wanted to say on that on, on that subject. Um, I do recommend that people look at and read and, and consider uh, the Jacques Silas works because they're they're absolutely worth reading and uh, you can still get them. They're still in print. But I, I would get them now before they, they end up doing to him what they've done to try to do to Roald Dahl and uh, the chap who wrote the, uh, the James Bond books because they're all about throwing things down the memory hole and, and um, making them relevant for a modern generation and all the rest of it. Anyway, that's it. In closing, I currently upload to... Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube, and Substack. So please like, share, and subscribe on all platforms. It's free to do, but a valuable way of giving back. Go to samgerrans.com and drop your email in the box to subscribe to my Substack letter and get all my new content delivered to your inbox. I back up my mailing list so that if big tech cancels me, we still have options. I work outside the mainstream and have no corporate sponsorship. So if you value what I do, you can help keep the lights on at samgerrans.com slash contribute or upgrade to a paid subscription on my stub Substack to access my more detailed work as well as comment, Substack being where I read all feedback. I continue to make my legacy projects available free. Summaries and links are at samgerrans.com slash books. Finally, I post news, thoughts and announcements to my Telegram channel at t.me slash Sam Gerrans. Thanks for listening and bye for now.